worship our God. Yeah. 
From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. Yeah, I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer.
All right, so let's get our Bible declaration and get into our word this morning. So glad to see some faces I haven't seen for some time also. This is my Bible. I believe that this word from Genesis to Revelation is the word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do, I will become what it says I can become. Therefore, I believe it and I receive it. I will subject myself to this word. And knowing that God cannot lie, I accept that this word is true. Just go back a bit for me, Rachel. Right. This morning, I want to talk about change. I want to talk about change. You can take it down there, you stand. There's a part that says, I am what it says I am. It means that the scripture would have declared us to be something. Whether you feel like it or not, the scripture already says certain things about us definitely. And one of those, for a simple one, is that you are the light of the world. Did Jesus say that? So, please say after me, I am, I am. the light of the world. Now, you can be doing different things with that light. You probably have it very high, and a lot of people can see their way. Or, you put, probably put it under a bushel, or under the bed. But guess what? Under the bed, is it still light? Yes, it is still light. Even if you put it under a bushel and it is not as bright as you would like it to be, is it still light? Yes, you are still light. I am what it says I am. If the Bible calls you light, you are light. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. Not so? And so you're supposed to bring flavor to people's lives. But he did say salt can lose its saltiness, but it will still be called salt may lose its saltiness. So you have to understand, when the Bible says you are something, the best thing to do is to agree with what the Bible has said about you. We're talking about change this morning. I can do what it says I can do. One of the problems we have is that we sometimes like to say, I can't. I can't do this. And I was sharing earlier on, one of the most famous lines or one of the requests that Jesus makes that most of us say that we can't do, especially is to forgive some hurts. Of all, of all, of all the counseling that we have done over the years, preaching and everything, the feedback we get most of people, of, or where they say, I can't do certain things, most of the time is forgiveness regarding certain hurts. It's not that you have not forgiven people before, but sometimes some hurts are just so painful, it goes to the bone. Sometimes you just cannot imagine that people who you love, people who you trust, would do you that. Jesus said, the same person who I dipped my hand in the bowl with, do you remember that? He said, that person, Judas, betrayed me. So sometimes you suffer something and then... Let's say so you come for counseling on this matter, and I say, well, you know, as hard as this is seeming, you have to forgive. And the pastor says, I can't forgive. You don't know what this person do to me, what they did to my family. I can't forgive. But you are saying something contrary to the scripture. The scripture told us to love our enemies, to do good to them who do us evil, to bless them that curse us. If he tells you to do it, you can. I'm not saying it's not difficult. You understand? But sometimes I won't is what you're really saying. Jesus told you, saying, I won't do it. Yeah, he's telling me, won't, and you tell me you can't. Can't mean that you don't have the ability to. And that is not true. Jesus in your life has given you the ability to love your enemies. That's not your love. That's why we call it the love of God. That's why we call it the fruit of the Spirit. That's not your fruit. That's God in you 
for you to allow him to manifest himself through you. But instead of you saying, I can't, he didn't, you're saying, I won't. I will become what it says I can become. And there are some things we haven't become as yet. This morning, Pastor Lona talked about in giving, and she has mentioned a little thing about tithes there. But I shared how I change. I changed when it came to money. I was cheap, very, very cheap. I was one of those birds. Okay, there's a song. Cheap, 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 cheap. All right, okay. Ah, you'll have to catch on a little faster with some of these jokes. I'm not so good at humor, so you have to at least laugh when it looks like a joke. So, uh, I was very, very cheap. Only one dollar bills I would give or in church. There was a time I ain't given more than a dollar. But I grew. I remember the first time that I gave $10. That was not a 100% increase. That was a 1,000% increase. Now, you all might find $10 is nothing, but that was a move from $1 to 10 times that multiplied by that. I gave. And then from $10, I started to hear about tights. I find I was overdoing it now. And I didn't have the ability to pay 10%. So it wasn't tight yet, but I'm moving in faith. So I move and I tried 5%. And I started to see my wealth really started to improve. I'm a management of my money. I, really, I used to be working two and three jobs, trying just to make money, make money, and still not seeing my money. I didn't know about tights. And then my wife and I, we read that same question, should I tighten my gross or my net? I saw vex I read the question, eh? Because I don't know the answer. You ever, you ever know the answer? Uh. Because that time I didn't have the faith yet, if you understand what I'm saying. So I'm now getting accustomed to the 10%. Now you have to tell me my 10% and my gross now. We did it. But I want you to know I was already using that money. That money was part of my everyday expenses. And now I'm taking that out of my system, not knowing how the whole will fall back, and giving to God. And I've seen God bless me. Now, he moved me from, from a dollar man to $10 to pay in 5%, now to factually pay tithes. And then he said, leave your job and come. Now, if I didn't see God faithful with $10, if I didn't see him faithful with when I was trying with my tithes, if I didn't see him when I could actually pay tithes, if I didn't see him faithful, he could not have asked me to leave my job. But I saw his faithfulness and I left everything and came. He arrested, I want you to know, you know, not, I didn't just say, <laughs> come in, you know. I wrestled with it, but my faith grew. Understand? My faith grew. I read in the Bible, we're talking about change. I did not want to remain the same stingy man. I wanted to grow. And these are things I never knew about. I did not know that people gave away lands. I didn't know that they sold property and brought all to the apostles' feet. When I would go to church, those things were never preached. So I never aspired to become that. So when I read and I said, my God, so these people can give so much. I aspired to move from 10% to having properties to sell and bring to the house of God. And I did it. I did it. I thank God for the opportunity to be able to give big. Why? Everything is God owned anyhow. Let me tell you something. Let's get this very clear. Whether you plan to give or you don't plan to give, nothing still belongs to you. Let's, are we clear on that? The scriptures say the cattle is mine, the gold is mine, everything is mine, the earth is mine, the fullness thereof, everything is mine. You have to know that. But then you may never experience something about God, but honoring his word. And I thank God for growth. Today we're talking about change. See, one of the reasons why some of us have not changed because we have stuck. We, we, we remain stuck in a process. Change is a process. Change doesn't end. In fact, let's talk some things that you may hear uh, people using as cliches. Have you ever heard the saying, change is the only constant? I've heard many people say that. Change is the only thing that is constant. Well, you're right. Then we had this one, um, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. We have a way of always wanting people to change. 
We have, a, we have always wanted to see the country become in better order. But we will still throw things out of our windows. We want to, you know, so you're only watching them criminal, but you're still breaking red light. We have to be the change. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Have you heard the, heard the saying too? You are set in your ways. Ever hear us saying that? People tell you that? You are set in your ways. What does that mean? That you are not changing. No matter what you hear, no matter what people tell you, no matter how they beg you, in fact, sometimes you saying, I grew up like this, and I am set in my ways, whether you like it or you don't. And you know we have some attitude with that. But today we are talking about change. How many times you have said you would change and get to realize it is more difficult than you think it is? Or what about becoming frustrated when you're asking other people to change or demanding that other people change? And then when they get so fed up, you say, you will never change. You make it look as though not even God could change that person. Pastor, don't even talk to that person about Jesus. He will never change. Because change is not as easy as we think it is. And I'll tell you why. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. And we'll tell you, if you want to change, there's something you need to put in your formula. In fact, I'm hoping that you would want to change. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. No? Hebrews 4 2? So the difference is we hear gospel. He said, we heard the same gospel that is, was preached when the children of Israel left Egypt. The difference, he said, is that they did not mix it with faith. An example. So you would believe that when they saw 10 miracles, Kenny, they would have changed. Guess what? They reached a place when they saw no water. And they talk as though they never saw 10 miracles. They saw God brought water out of the rock. And one time they say, we fed up with manna. Bring meat. God could never supply meat out here. God shook his head again. How come these people seen all these things and they still would not change? Because you know why? They didn't mix it with faith. What is the difference between us here this, uh, today? Well, the only difference with us here today is faith. All of us would hear the same sermon. But the only difference is faith. Some of you would change and some of you will not change. I'm serious. Because you're applying no faith to what you hear. So even sometimes while you're here and preaching, you say, I know I can't do that, you know. He could say what he wants, you know. And you're going, no faith applying to any change in your life. And so you are stuck in time, even with your own transformation. We are being transformed, and we're supposed to be transformed. But let me tell you this. So when you came to Christ, that was a transformation. Change took place. If any man be in Christ, he becomes a what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You didn't do anything and everything of your whole life, every sin that you have committed, everything that was nailed against you, gone. In one day, bam, that's a change. But the question is now, what did you do with that new life to show change came? If you had mixed it with faith, somebody would have been able to see and tell you, you really change. But if nobody told you that you change, you came to Christ, all your sins gone, but not one person, even in your family, mentioned your change, then you have to question yourself, did I really change? A change was done for you, but you're not applying anything with faith. Let's take a look at, at this portion of scriptures here. Romans 1.17 
And then we look at Isaiah 28. Romans 1, 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? By faith, not by facts. We live by faith. I didn't have the faith when I started with my one dollar man. Didn't have the faith, but I moved from one dollar to ten dollars. Faith. Faith. From ten dollars to paying five percent, I couldn't call it tight. But when I reached the tight, I was faith. From that to leave a job, faith, more faith. Let me give you an example of how my faith grew. If you look behind that, this building here, you will see like an old building structure right behind. I had made an offer to the owner to buy it a few years ago. And he told me, all right, $60,000. When he tell me that $60,000, my belly get weak. I almost get diarrhea. Sixty thousand dollars. Where I get that money from? In my mind, I had the faith for about thirty thousand. When he tell me that, I, I, I didn't even I didn't even go through with the deal again. I missed that opportunity because I didn't have the faith. I just want to tell you something: how you go from faith to faith. This extension of the church cost us close to a million dollars. Just within four years' time. My feet jump up like that. We are renting a car park. I wouldn't even have the faith to do that before. What are paying for the rent? I could have buy in the back there already. But my faith grew. If you understand what I'm saying. Because you change. You are supposed to change. You so move, you're supposed to move from faith to faith. So you may start with no faith. But you're supposed to move from faith to faith. Why some of us don't grow in faith? I'll tell you why. Isaiah 28 verses 9 and 10. This is really important here. This is really important why some of us don't grow in faith. Why we don't get a revelation from God. Who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Let's pause there. There are some people who don't want to do anything for themselves. They don't want to develop spiritually at all. If you don't read your Bible, you cannot develop spiritually. You have to depend on somebody giving you a word all the time. Somebody always has to give you a word. And that's why you can be misled. And that's why a false prophet can just run anywhere with you. That's why people can come all kind of thing and tell you, a dream, so and so, uh, I pull your foot. And you whole night, you, you weak. Where's the word? Where, where's your faith? No. You don't want to do nothing for yourself. You don't want to seek God for yourself. You don't want to know who God is. You want to be Pastor Stephen every little thing. I mean, I'm going to exaggerate here. Pastor Stephen, a mosquito bite me last night, and I see two buttons on my hand. Pray for me, please. Hey, pray for yourself a little bit now. Amen. But you, you want to be latch on on the breast. Still want milk. Paul said it's time to eat meat. But your faith wouldn't grow if you're not putting things in place. I know some children, they go in primary school already, you know, they're talking about the standard one, standard two, and still want to come home for tatats, you know. When they reach home, they say, Mommy, and they're pulling, you know. That's why some fathers just had to come in and hit them a little, get, get away from your mother. Time to grow up. Time to grow up. And even in the spiritual life, the Bible is saying you will not get revelation from God, you will not get knowledge from God if you don't want to be weaned, if you don't want to go through anything in life at all. Every trial that you go through, you haven't started to go through the trial yet. You're waiting for a preacher to tell you, and today is your day to come out of trials. And you haven't started walking the thing yet. There's no processing. So your character is not building because you don't want to go through anything in life. So there's no change. There's no change. Today I want to use an acronym for change. We'll only deal with three of them today. An acronym for change. C. Christ-like. 
H, humility. A, appreciation. N, never give up. G, giver. E, evangelize. Let's go with Christ-like. If the goal of Christianity is not to become like Christ, then I am asking you rhetorically, why are you coming to church? Let me say that again. If the goal of Christianity is to become like Christ, but that's not your intention, then I'm asking you to ask yourself, why are you coming to church? Why do you come to church if you don't plan to become like Christ? Why hasn't a husband gotten a better wife yet? Or a wife got a better husband? Why aren't you a, a, a more humble child? Why aren't you a better worker and you come into church? You are hearing everything of the gospel. But it is not your goal to become like Christ. So what will happen? Well, in the time of judgment, this sermon and others will stand before you. And God will say, you heard my word. But you did not care to mix it with feet. You did not care to become like me. Is that important to become like Jesus Christ? Well, let's see. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We don't get baptized into religion. That is one correction I have. You know, since you ask people... Uh, have you been baptized? They say, yeah, I baptized Baptist. Oh, Baptist, what Baptist? What? Baptist and then baptism? I baptized Pentecostal. Pentecostal did not invent baptism. Adventists didn't. You did not baptize into none of those. If you baptize into any one of those, then you're still lost. We are baptized into Christ. And because we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. We throw off the man. And we put on Christ. That's why people have a right to expect to see Christ in us. Because we put him on. You want to know if you have Christ in you? Sometimes you light as I say under the bushel. Eh? You ever with some people in your job, they curse, nobody tell them nothing. You use a half a cuss. You stop at your mother and you stop right there. And everybody, oh, look at the Christian. Watch the Christian. People using expletives whole day. Your boss using expletives. They have nothing to say. Why? Because they are not light. They are not light, so nobody have nothing to say. But when you, even if your light was under a bushel, are telling you light is light. Because you have put on Christ. And when you put on Christ, people expect expect you to walk in a certain way. They expect you to talk in a certain way. And you yourself must know that expectation is of you. You have put on. That's change. Don't want to be the old man and you already become a new man. Put on Christ. Here, this, 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 one, this one I really, really love. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ. Remember earlier on, when we were doing the Bible declaration, I said, I am what it says I am? Hear what the Bible said. Those of us who have put on Christ, we have the mind of Christ. Did you see he did not tell us to develop that? Are you seeing that? You already have that, you know. So therefore, if you live contrary, it is by choice. Because you already have the mind of Christ. You don't have, because you cannot go and fabricate that. You don't know how, where to start from. Where to start to, from to put a mind of Christ in you. You don't know where to start. So Christ, bam, he gave you that. I gave you my mind. So you know how I think. You know how I relate to God. You know how I relate to people. Tell me something. Most of the times that you do wrong, did you know it was wrong? Thanks for telling me. Any on this side. 
Most of the times you did wrong, did you know it was wrong? This side. Did you know it was wrong? How do you know that? Because you have the mind of Christ. And because you have the mind of Christ, you also have the willpower of Christ. It's just that you choose to do your own thing. That's why the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. Because he already gave you his spirit. His holy seed is in you. You don't have to fight. Hey, hey. You don't have to fight to become Christ. You, Christ is in you. You have to let him be formed. You have to give the baby growth. Let him, let him you see. That's why he said, don't quench the spirit. Don't quench it. You know, like someone like this say, listen, I'll come down this cross, you know. <laughs> I'll put down my Christianity and hit your two cars and go back in and, and church and repent, you know. That's how some of us operate in our Christian life because we don't want to put on and remain as Christ. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you would find rest to your souls. Now, we are not only supposed to look like Christ in character, we must also look like Christ in power. Christ came operating in two ways, in power and in character. So the fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ, but then we have power. John uh, 14, 12 says, John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that believe in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Does Jesus lie? Does Jesus lie? Church, does Jesus lie? If Jesus said that the work that I do, you shall do also, is he speaking the truth? It is just that we don't present ourselves to do the work that Christ did. Agreed? And greater, wow, wait, wait, wait. First one, he said, you are equal in what I do. And then he said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my father. He said, I did plenty in my time here, but you will do more than I did when you go back to the father. Question is if we want to change. Let's get Mark um, 16, 17 and 18 to show you that we must reflect Christ in power also. This is relating to power. And these signs shall follow them that believe. We talk about those who put on Christ. You have to want to change. In my name. What is that name? You could use that name here loosely. What is that name? Jesus. You could still say it louder. This place make for that name. What is that name? Jesus. Ay, ay, ay. In my name shall they cast out devils. We don't run from devils. We don't hide when devils come. We let them know that we know Jesus. What's her name? Jesus. What's her name? Jesus. In my name, in the name of Jesus, we cast out devils. We speak with new tongues. Some of you afraid to talk in tongues. We speak in new tongues. It's a language that we speak unto God. That's a change. All the, all the time we know how to pray. Bam, God give you tongues. You're spending hours with God. That's a change. You need to change. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. The sick shall recover. Let your faith grow. Pray for people. Pray for your friend. Pray for your family. Pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. Pray for the children. Let the children pray for you. Develop faith. I pray. That is change. We must be like Christ in character and in power. I just want to mention this one in Luke 9, 53 to 56. Jesus had asked to go in a certain place of Samaria and they didn't want him there. And his disciples say, Lord, you mean to say they refuse you? I'm paraphrasing. Should we call down fire upon them like Elisha? This is a real important. They say, you know not of what spirit you are. For the Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Anytime you hear anybody try to make you frightened by saying, you interfered, man, I'll go do for you. You must know they could never be talking in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't care which church they're going to. I don't care if they look as though they're using the Bible. I don't care if they say in the name of Jesus. If anybody 
threaten you. And they say, I got to do for you. They know not of what spirit they are. They are not of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ came to give life, not to damage and to hurt people. Amen. So those of you who would have dirty your hand, please, you get on a chance to wash it today. Amen. Change. H, humility. This is the opposite of arrogance. It is the opposite of, opposite of your own majesty and excellence. It is you, your self-sufficiency. It is considering yourself to be low, no matter how much you have. It's like David say, I'm a king, but you know what I really prefer to be? I prefer to be an usher in the house of God. You understand? He never see himself as any big, big thing. No matter he was the king, beloved of God, he considered himself a humble person. Proverbs 29, 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. You know how many relationships have fallen apart today because of pride? Because nobody budging? That's pride. Nobody saying sorry. The man say, I see man, man don't say sorry. And the relationship falling apart. The woman wrong, she, will, she ain't saying sorry for nothing. For nothing, nothing. That's pride. You can't say sorry. Who are you? We are all sinners, so how come you can't say sorry? Even the Lord said, repented him to do things. When, when uh, God, Moses said, God said, I'll kill all these people, Moses said, if you do that, I ain't coming. He said, I did repent of me for saying that. If God could do that, who are you? Humble yourself. People losing jobs because of pride. Squaring off with boss, husband and wife squaring off, children squaring off with their parents. If you are a son, Standing in your father's face, nose to nose, daddy. Because your voice had to get a little heavy now. And my, my parents used to say a long time, you're peeing fraught. So all of a sudden you feel, that's pride. It is humility that cuts the path for you, not pride. And so relationships are falling apart. Bam, bam, bam. All your relationships are falling apart because there's no humility. And even the relationship with God is falling apart. Why I could tell you that? First Peter 5 verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Children today don't even want to listen to the elders. They're going to school and don't even want to listen to teachers. Yea, all of you, all of you now, be subject one to another. I am subject to everybody in here, just as you are subject to me. You don't know rank here. No, I only have a different position, you know. But all of us getting judged by God and by the same word, you understand? So I, I can't show off for nobody. And be clothed, be clothed with humility. Be clothed. Humility is not weakness. It takes more strength to control yourself than to just explode. Be clothed with humility. For God resist the proud and give grace to the humble. God resist the proud person. You feel he is all that? Boy, God will make you catch your skin in life. He will resist you. Everything you want to do, he plucking and he holding it down. Why? Because he's resisting you because you're too proud. He gives grace to the humble person. You went and dig a well and somebody take it from you. You want to fight for all the rights? The Lord said, leave that. Isaac did that. He dug an next well. They came and they take it again. The Lord said, leave that. He dug a next one and they left him. He said, well, the Lord blessed me with this one. That calls for humility. But we want to fight for every right. And you end up with no relationship at all. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus said the high and the lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. The Lord said, I am dwelling with a person who when they do wrong, the conscience affect them, the contrite and the humble. To revive the spirit of the humble. To revive it, you know. Because sometimes, you know, you just feel, and people walking over me, you know. 
I'm losing my opportunity. You know. I better go and the Lord will revive your spirit and say, wait. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God knows how to make you stand up again and to refresh you. You don't need pride for that. Finally, appreciation. Finally for today, this sermon will continue next week. Appreciation is the true hallmark of those who have learned the ways of God. The ability to say thanks and to be thankful for and in every situation. An appreciation for time and seasons. To appreciate the opposites in life. You know when you do a wedding vow, you say for better, for worse, those are the opposites in life. A contentment that breeds a level of peace that amazes even you. That is when you know you reach a level of understanding God. Can you give thanks for everything? It's not always easy. Listen, right in this church here, there's some pains I know, some pains I don't know, but we had resident in this church, this, this, this service this morning, some real journey of pains. But you know what the Lord says? Say thank you. Because dead people can't say thanks. Say thank you. Say thank you. It, were you only saying thanks when things nice? I wonder why God didn't make the whole world flat. Anybody ever wonder? Just make the whole world flat. Easy. But he have mountains that's so tall that people who try to climb it, many have died. And he have valleys that are so rugged that people have also died in the valley. He made the famous David who wrote all the Psalms say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Seeing that a so thing that they tell you, you're going dead, you know. Even though you feeling you would die. And he said, walk through that. Experiences in life. He said, but a person who come to understand God is thankful in every situation and for every situation. Whether you understand it or don't understand it. Let me give you an example. Let's hear what Paul said. Um, in Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. See, there are people who quote this verse 13. But they don't want to go through nothing about verse 11 and 12. They don't want to go through no hunger in life. They don't want to be abased in life. They always want to abound and always want to be full. And now you're talking about I can do all things. So the day when things are work out, I can handle this sinner. Look, you hear what your mouth saying? I can't handle this. Sir. I can't go through this. Sir. I, I can't, I can't, I can't. But yet you want to quote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Once it doesn't uh, challenge me, and once, you know, my, my, my wallet full, and once, you know, my belly full, and once I'm abounding, I can do all things. But everything that goes a little tough, I can't. You got to change that. You have to change that. You have to learn to appreciate. Appreciate when you enjoy the air condition and when it have no uh, electricity for whatever reason and we open the window and the place get hot and you start to sweat. Appreciate it. Thank God that your paws are working and you could sweat. Find something to give thanks for. We have a gentleman who comes to church with one leg. He's glad. He could still hop on one. There are those who have none. You understand what I'm saying? Find something to give thanks for. Be thankful for everything. Be thankful in everything. Ephesians 5, 20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, In everything give thanks for this is what? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. This is God's will, you know. And that's why I'm saying, if you come to a place of appreciation, then you start to understand what walking in Christ is. Then I know you're growing up. 
that I know, then you will not be complaining about that man all the time. Can I get an amen? Thank you for the three of you that came to church this morning. If you are thankful, you'll be glad for that child to have. It might be giving a little headache today, but people change. And you change? You are here today. <laughs> Some of them thought you would have never changed. But look at what the Lord has done. You still have hope, living hope. Your business might have gone through a, a dunk. Don't worry. Learn to give thanks. You will come back up again. You must always live in hope. There will be a better tomorrow. But you have to be able to appreciate what you what, You have to ask, what have I learned from this? What have I learned from this situation? What has this taught me about myself? I'll tell you this about change and about giving thanks and appreciating. Jesus was preaching for some time and the people got hungry. It was three days of preaching. And when he finished, he said, he told, he's talking to Andrew and he's talking to Thomas and the others. He say, you all go and buy some food for them. They say, we don't even have enough money. 200 penny wood cannot buy bread for everybody here. Andrew said, hey, let's have a boy with five loaves and two fish. But what is that? See, one said 200 penny wood, which even song in more than five loaves and two fish. And then Andrew saw somebody and then he said now on top of that, but what is this? And Jesus said, tell the lad to come. And let's see if this lad will give us his five loaves and two fish. Some of us, when we are asked to give our last, we don't give it at all. The woman of Zarephath was asked to give her last. She gave her last. This young man, five loaves and two fish. That was for him alone. He was asked, can you give it to me please? And he gave it to Jesus. What did Jesus do? Did he complain? No. Did he see the lack? No. He lifted up and he gave thanks. Sometimes the money that comes in your hand is less than what you want. But it is more than nothing. Always remember that. It may be less than what you need, less than what you want, but it is more than nothing. People talk about seeing the glass half full and half empty. So what if the glass is quarter full? It is still more than an empty glass. And you must learn to give thanks. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks for everything. Bless your money. Your children will eat food. None will go hungry. Hear what I'm telling you? Show God that you appreciate this one bread. And say, so we are going to cut up this bread for nine of us today. And we just thank the Lord to bless you. And you cut that. And them children, you hear them burping as they just eat a big plate of food. Because God is able to do that. Sometimes he passes you through things to see what would you do? What would you do to give thanks? Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord some praise today? If you notice, I did not ask you to become better. I didn't ask you to change to become better. I didn't ask that. That is a nebulous thing. One person asked me this morning, Pastor Stephen, I want to change. I have this challenge. I have this challenge, and his was smoking. I have this challenge with smoking. I want to give up smoking. It, it is such a difficult thing for me. It, I said, let me tell you this. You may have seven things to change and one is giving you a problem right now. Take your mind off of the difficult one and go for the low-hanging fruit. What is the low-hanging fruit? The things that are easier to change. There are some things in your life that are easier to change probably than the smoking. Start with this one before you're tiptoeing to climb for that one up there. That might be a real big one that you need to change. But start with the one that you can manage. You will get courage and faith. You will grow from faith to faith to go for the one that is here. You understand? And then you'll go from faith to faith to go to the one that is here. And then the day, while you are here, you get to realize that that smoke in every reach and he will just fall off himself. Because you get the faith to move forward in life. That's how you change. You change here a little, there a little. You learn 
Not everything. Don't try to learn the Bible in one day. You learn line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. But when you read, it is good to say, Lord, what I read today, help me to become it. Uh, let's try that. Lord, what I read today, help me to become. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're so thankful that you tuned in to our program today. This program is not complete unless we give you an opportunity to increase hope in your life by accepting the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Say this prayer after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask that you forgive me of all my sins and become my Lord. If you had said that prayer, you are forgiven and you are saved. Communicate with us through the following contact information and we'll get right back to you. May I leave the blessing of Almighty God with you, taken from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We thank you for tuning in. For prayer, you can contact us at 304-4145 or email your request to needprayer at ourmissiontt.com. For more information on services and events, visit our website at www.ourmissiontt.com. To access today's service and much more, like and follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you all.